Welcome to the Adventures in CRE audio series. Join Michael Belasco and Spencer Burton as they pull back the curtain on everything commercial real estate and introduce you to some of the top minds in the industry. If you want to take your skills to the next level and be part of a growing community of CRE professionals across the world, this is for you. Hello and welcome back to another uh, podcast. The Adventures in CRE podcast slash uh, audio series is really fun. Sometimes we do it in seasons. Sometimes we get to do it with awesome guests like our guest today, Brian Murray. Uh, Brian, thanks for being here first and foremost. Thanks for having me. Excited to be here. Yeah, we're excited to have you. So just a quick little introduction. And I, I think in terms of what Brian does and how he does it, it is such a really cool and fresh way of looking at maybe a very traditional um, business like commercial real estate, very traditional. Brian is the CEO of Shift Capital. And if you go to his LinkedIn bio, it has a really slick, very smooth way of talking about how he combines social impact focused real estate development in a very creative and entrepreneurial passionate way. So I'm excited to talk to you today. I know the team is. Um, Michael, you and Brian became acquainted first, so I'm going to kind of turn it over to you real, real quick to set up the conversation and talk about uh, Shift Capital and what Brian's up to today. Yeah, so we um, first got connected with Shift. Um, Brian's uh, CFO, I believe, Ralph, had reached out to us, and just we started a conversation, and lo and behold, they're right in my hometown here of uh, Philadelphia. And so we had had a bunch of conversations, and I was amazed at what they were doing and the work they were they were uh, projects they were putting together down in um, some some up and coming neighborhoods around the city and even beyond Philadelphia. And so through a bunch of conversations, I decided that Brian would be an excellent guest uh, to have on this on the show. And I think he would really be a valuable resource um, of information to all of our our um, audience members. And so how about we kick it off, Brian? Why don't you give us an overview of what you do, shift capital, and just just we'll start there. Uh, what you guys are doing currently today, and then maybe we'll delve a bit into your background and your journey through real estate itself. But let's start with shift and, and what you guys are up to today. Sure. Well, again, thanks for having me on, guys. Uh, always uh, appreciate the opportunity to talk about our work and the communities we work in. Uh, we are a B certified impact real estate group, and um, for those who don't know what B certified is, it's a a designation that um, certifies that we focus on not just our financial returns for our investors, which we do, but also our social and environmental returns uh, to society. And we measure that on, on a yearly basis. What that means, though, is that in, in real estate terms is that basically we're a vertically integrated group that focuses primarily first on place. So we were founded with a very deliberate mission to, um, uh, to influence, influence the poverty equation. And our belief that poverty exists at a zip code level, well, not our belief, this is data-driven, um, that uh, zip code affects the success of young kids in our society more than probably any other factor. Uh, and to create a model that was investing in place. Um, what that meant was that we were investing in um, uh, underserved neighborhoods, starting in our home city of Philadelphia, in, in a way that we were doing it at scale, we were doing it holistically, and, uh, and we were doing it out in front of the marketplace so that we could really, from a real estate 101 perspective, ensure that we had a low basis of real estate, which is a big key of this. Um, what that means is that we're not multifamily developers. We're not office developers. We're not affordable housing developers. We're not retail developers or holders. Uh, we're really a combination of all of those things. Um, we've done everything from 800 square foot row homes to 800,000 square foot 19 acre industrial sites in the city that just so happen to be two blocks away from each other. Um, but this approach uh, from a holistic standpoint means that we're focused on neighborhood. Uh, we really believe in lifting all boats, um, and uh, that can only be, do, be done in underserved neighborhoods if you're doing it at scale, so you can influence enough of that, uh, of that economic development trajectory. Uh, and then 
The last piece is this idea of uh, you know, coming in early uh, so that we can really program and think strategically about how we work with the existing community, how we include them, um, how we think about wealth building opportunities that they might be able to see as a result of our investments. Uh, and then long term, you know, what is an exit? What is a responsible exit strategy look like? You know, if you're bringing in capital, outside capital, and you've got to exit your your real estate, um, you know, are we in the negative sense just exacerbating, you know, what folks would consider the negative aspects of gentrification or displacement? And so that's our core of what we do. Um, in addition to that, we have uh, for the last several years been focusing and working in other places uh, where we uh, partner up with um, other up and coming impact developers because we realized that journey was difficult for ourselves and we want to find ways in which to diversify the real estate space uh, and, and, and also bring in more impact developers into the space. Uh, so that's it in a nutshell, and I'll let you ask questions from there. A lot to unpack there. Let, before we really dig into impact development, I'm, re, I'm very interested in um, you know how you approach capital and and how you approach uh, potential co GP partnerships. But uh, you personally, Brian, how did you get into impact development? Uh, it looks like you've you've been around what eight years at, at Shift, but certainly. That there must have been some journey prior to that that led you to to, to start shift and get into this space. Yeah, I, uh, I, you know, it's it's important to understand. I wasn't a real estate person. Um, I didn't have real estate experience, but um, I did. Um, my background, you know, in brief, uh, was I was a, an accountant. I was a tech entrepreneur, and I was a Peace Corps volunteer. And you put that all into a into a bottle. You shake it all up and. You know, and, and I went back to business school to try to combine all those things. And I wanted to do good and do well at the same time. I didn't want to be in the nonprofit space. I didn't want to be in the governmental space. I knew I wanted to be an entrepreneur. Um, and I knew that this was the, the you know, our, our, our capital system for all its faults, um, you know, was the place that I wanted to be to drive uh, uh, better outcomes for society. And... I stumbled into real estate while I was in business school doing a, a deal in, in 2008 um, that really opened my eyes into, you know, uh, into how real estate affects people's lives directly, which is an important component of what I wanted to do. I wanted it to be meaningful directly uh, with people. And in fact, you know, for me, there is no greater tool that impacts people's lives than real estate. Um, we're in it 24 hours a day. Uh, in whatever form that takes, whether you're walking through a neighborhood, whether you're working, whether you're living. Um, and that was combined with the kind of epiphany, and I, and I called it epiphany, but it was really, you know, everyone talks about a light bulb moment. Mine is like a series of like Christmas light bulb moments, like hundreds and thousands of them over a little bit of time. Um, but really understanding that, that, that what type of capital runs through underserved neighborhoods, and especially in you know, um, our hometown of, of Philadelphia that has largely been dominated by slumlords of all types, um, you know, taking advantage of communities and or, in you know, uh, just dealing with the economics of low income neighborhoods and and the communities ended up being on the on the on the bad end of that. And that was really the, the start of it for me. I fell in love with real estate, you know, almost right away, jumped into it. Um, and, uh, you know, if I knew then what I knew now, uh, I, I, you know, I don't know if I would have gone entrepreneurial right off the bat because, um, you know, it's it's I, I've been in a startup for 12 years, I feel like. Um, and, uh, you know, real estate is it, it takes a while to build and, and do these things. And uh, but, you know, we've done a lot of great work and, um, you know, uh, uh, and, and I, I have no regrets. So so let me ask you, you're, you're now. I guess twelve years as an entrepreneur. Um, put it another way, I mean, you, you've you have all the scars. You've looked at a lot of deals. Uh, in twenty twenty two, how do you know, Brian, uh, when you see a deal that it's a good deal? Like what mm, what yeah. what is the criteria that you're looking for? Because you, you said you're not necessarily yeah. an apartment or an office or an industrial developer. Um, 
but certainly there's some criteria that you see that and you go, that is, that's a good deal. That's what I'm looking for. My quick response to that is that, you know, impact when you see it. And I, and I, and that isn't meant to be, you know, too flippant. Um, but there is a certain amount of that that comes with it. But we do have a series of criteria that we run everything through and lenses that we run everything through. So we look at our, our work in kind of three different buckets. And one is, you know, at least when we're partnering up with others, you know, is the, um, the values, the ethics, the, um, the, the, the importance of impact to that sponsor and what they want to accomplish. And, you know, do they share the same things that we do in terms of, you know, why they're doing this? Um, so that's one, two is the opportunity itself. And I'll, I'll come back to that because that really is, I think the crux of your question. Um, so, you know, does the, do, does the financials make sense? Does the neighborhood make sense? Does the project make sense? Obviously that's a, you know, a huge part of it. And third for us is what is actually the impact on the community itself? And we try to bring all of those lenses to it. Um, but assuming for a minute that we've got the sponsor, the right sponsor we want to work with, um, in, in the case, again, where we partner up, in the cases where we do it ourselves, this applies directly, is the deal itself. Um, we're primarily, I would say, driven by, you know, uh, by low basis real estate, uh, public transportation, um, and opportunities for public-private um, uh, partnerships. Our team is built on expertise in very, very ca complicated capital stacks, you know, uh, new market tax credits, LIHTC, uh, every other type of city, state, federal subsidy. Pay we did the first PACE project, if you got, or CPACE project in, in Pennsylvania. Um, all of those things have to come into it. And if we feel like a, a deal has enough um, of those impact storylines that are going to drive some of those uh, some of those pieces, then you know that's certainly a big part of the equation. Um, but but you know we ended up buying two million square feet of space in Philadelphia, all within a five minute block to to public transportation. There's only two subway lines in Philadelphia, so we're you know we're not New York City or DC in that regard. Um, and uh, and we were able to buy everything for four dollars a square foot ten years ago. And you know those are those are things that allow you to drive impact while also driving returns for investors. So let me ask you: um, outside of the the numbers making sense, what do you define as successful when it comes to the impact of a project on a community? Do we create the ripple effect? You know, we look at our projects. Well, I guess there's two pieces to this, and they're interrelated. On one hand, what's the soul of that building? And, and typically that soul of the building is actually not driven by the real estate directly. It's actually driven by who's in that real estate. So, you know, uh, our two projects, one of them I'm sitting in right now where our offices are, are making studios north and south in, in Kensington and Philadelphia. Uh, for background, for those not familiar with Philadelphia, Kensington is the opioid center of the world, I'm sorry to say, um, and uh, one of the most challenged neighborhoods you will probably ever see. Um, but nestled in between all that in two large re adaptive reuse buildings equaling total about 250,000 square feet of space, we have uh, probably 80 to 90 entrepreneurs and probably 500 to 600 uh, jobs that are related to those entrepreneurs and those nonprofits and those small businesses. And when I think about success, I think about all those entrepreneurs in this neighborhood um, walking on the street, buying stuff from local businesses, uh, and that economic ripple effect, um, you know, is a big part of it. But who we build for, whether it's a charter school, whether it's these entrepreneurs, whether it's mixed income housing, you know, which we're, we're big believers of um, uh, long term. Um, you know, we're really looking at kind of, you know, who are we bringing into in the neighborhoods we're working in and, and how are we also then bringing that community into those projects as well? Um, so that might be a community benefits agreement. You know, that could be, you know, having community members be directly part of the project in a variety of ways. It, it, it comes in a lot of different forms. 
Uh, you had said in when you were talking about pivoting into this, going back to school, you said a line and I wrote it down because I was like, oh, that's it's a really good place to start. Like you wanted to do good, but you also want, wanted to do well. I think that was your exact quote. And doing obviously you can I, I, I can feel even by what you're saying that there's a ton of intent behind this. But I can also feel that there must be some compromises, some, you know, the, like the financial, like the the, you know, the duty to the money involved in these transactions must be sometimes a conflict. And I'm wondering if that's an ever present conflict, if that's something on a daily basis, you're like, Hey, we have our North star is doing good, but at the same time you do have like this fiduciary duty on the other hand. So I wonder how difficult does that make? And you have your three buckets. I went through each one of them. I'm like, Oh, I see how he's doing that. But I'm wondering how much of that is like, okay, math, two plus two is four. And then how much of that is just like sometimes pushing the math to the side a little bit and like, what are the compromises you're making? What, what is, yeah. what is it like to execute your model that you're doing on a daily basis? It's a great, it's, it is the question. So I appreciate you asking. I personally, um, and it's, you know, it's, it's, it's bearing out believe that, when you work in a neighborhood model, a concentrated scaled model, that the, the decisions we might make to, let's say, give a certain tenant that we really, really like and think is going to be valuable to the community and to the place and to the building, let's say we're, we're, we make some compromises on, on our square footage with them, right? Or, or so, uh, yeah, the, the pricing of the rent, right? Um, to get them in there, make it work. Maybe we spent a couple more dollars than we would on TI to get them in. Ultimately, in the long run, that that group is actually going to have a financial impact on the rest of the projects and the rest of the sites in a more positive way than trying to cut the sharpest deal every time with whoever walks in the door. Um, so it's a you know there's a curation to this that I think actually. If you're in it for the long term, absolutely plays out better for 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 investors. Um, and you know, one good example of that 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 is concrete, probably for a lot of real estate folks, is you know, is is do you put do you put the dollar store, you know, that's going to pay thirty five bucks a square foot, or do you go maybe and and try to find the non you know the the local grocer that has maybe uh, you know, that's Latino owned or what have you, but maybe they can only pay $23 a square foot. And the short run is obviously the dollar store. You got credit tenant, you know, it's going to play out the cap rates on the, your exit, all those things we're talking about. But if I own the buildings around that, well, the dollar store in the long run is actually going to have a more detrimental effect on the rest of my portfolio. So, that's, and you, you made the right, that's one example of how we look at it, but I will tell you it's an everyday conversation. Um, it's, it's not simple, you know, it's a, there's a lot of gray there. Um, and, um, you know, it, this does come back to, we wanna make a neighborhood uh, a place desirable to live in for both the community that's there so that, you know, if they, in Kensington, people wanna leave Kensington, can we make it a place where people wanna stay in Kensington? And then two, can we make it a place that, you know, other people want to live who are bringing uh, discretionary income into that neighborhood? And that only happens with that, with, with, you know, trying to figure out the right way to program and curate and bring the right type of groups in that are catering to all parts. But it definitely is compromising at some times. And, um, you know, we do what we, the best we can to kind of navigate both of those, uh, those challenges. That's interesting. So it's a holistic view. You're looking at you're looking at the whole rather than the individual. And some, sometimes you give up on an individual asset in exchange for um, a, a broader benefit to, it sounds like not just the community, but also to your, your holdings, right? That, and, and as you represent your capital. Let me ask another question that's somewhat related to what Sam's describing. So in traditional real estate think, uh, success is measured by um, value growth. Um, value growth generally is a function of rental growth. Rental growth is a function of 
tenants being able to pay more on a year over year basis. Yeah. Uh, you, you brought up gentrification at the very beginning. Uh, and, and so this kind of goes there. Um, they, they really conflict with one another, right? Yeah. This idea that as you, as, as you see success, at least from a real estate standpoint in a neighborhood, uh, wealth creation, um, uh, r rental growth, value growth, and many people benefit from that. Not, I, I get not just the, the owners of real estate, but let's be honest, wealth creation is asymmetrical uh, and certain people will be left, up, left behind um, for whatever reason. Um, you couple that with uh, yeah, people outside the neighborhood moving in and they bring in um, kind of a, a, a rent expectation that pushes up rent. H how do you... Um, how do you view the challenges around kind of that gentrification piece to success? Uh, yeah. How do you ensure that the, the fabric of the neighborhood is maintained and those who want to stay in the neighborhood can while at the same time recognizing the reality of success is value growth uh, and, and value growth oftentimes has a, has a side impact of, of unfortunately, you know, making, making great areas un, unaffordable. Yeah. Um, so yeah. Talk us through how, how you how you confront that and, and any strategies that that your firm and others are are, are deploying in order to, to combat that. Yeah, I mean, I think this is the question of, of society right now. We've seen neighborhoods after neighborhood. And, you know, I think that people have very um, uh, opposing views on the, the positivity of that. Um, and it probably depends on in that asymmetric relationship, where do you, where do you sit in that, in that bucket? Um, you know, it is, it is probably, you know, three, four hours of conversation. What, what I'll say is the one, one com, there's a few, three comments I want to make here. One is that um, we, we do our, we do our best to lean as much toward the community as, 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 as possible. And if, a group like us isn't coming into this neighborhood and, and investing, either two things are gonna happen. Either the status quo, and if you've ever been to Kensington for as one example of many places we invest, um, the status quo is not acceptable for people who live here. Um, you know, crime, uh, drugs, uh, a, a lot of challenges uh, going on here. Or it will gentrify in the more traditional way which is typically, you know, a lot of, you know, piranhas, right? There's usually a lot of fast moving, smaller players that kind of eat away at land value. Um, but ultimately, you know, maybe they're, they're new, a little nebulous. It's not some big related, com you know, uh, like the related companies or shift, um, but ultimately they eat away at and, and really drive gent the, 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 that, that gentrification equation. So we're open book about it. We, we don't claim that we can prevent displacement. Um, you know, we'd like to talk about it openly and there's a lot of great studies and uh, on, um, you know, on that, that we can dive into. Um, but at the same time, you know, that lean is really, really important to who we are and what we do. And, and um, you know, it's a dangerous position because, you know, sometimes we are considered perhaps the gentrifiers in the negative sense. And, you know, we have to kind of wear our, you know, wear our hats of trying to do the best job we can in that realm. And, you know, sometimes there's going to be people that, that, um, that, that view it differently. And I, and I get that. What, what I, I, the more important question is what do we do about it? Right. So, um, you know, for the last 10 years, we have been, think there are no, there are very few, if no financial tools available to cities and developers to prevent that eternal interest in developers to get 15% returns plus on stuff. You know, if, if we're successful and we sell it, someone's buying it thinking, hey, I want 15% returns, which ultimately is going to continue, continue, and continue. So we did... Um, we started the first neighborhood trust in the country, um, which is a trust um, 
uh, that we helped found with uh, a few other stakeholders that is now 100% controlled by the community and business owners in the neighborhood. Uh, they own uh, an entire city block and are buying more real estate in the neighborhood with an explicit goal in an evergreen fund uh, to keep it uh, mission um, and, uh, and preserved uh, on the commercial side as a commercial corridor neighborhood trust uh, for, the, for, the, uh, for the community. So, you know, this is funded by the Ford Foundation, by uh, locally, uh, the, the Barra Foundation, Spring Point Foundation, um, um, all with what are called PRIs, which are um, program-related investments that require two, three, four percent returns instead of 15 percent returns, uh, run by an incredible executive director locally that is absolutely crushing it, um, named Adriana Vizida, and we are fully trying to support those type of vehicles and those tools because there's not a lot of options out there uh, for cities to create what we think needs to happen, which is mixed income communities. Um, you know, we, we need to find a way to preserve and develop at the same time. And that's ultimately what we're trying to do um, when we think about this over over a long period of time. Awesome. Let's um, I want to take the last few minutes we have here and dive into some of the specifics, some of your projects, maybe. Um, I read through, I saw um, a deck uh, from you guys that you have this developer and residence program that you guys are doing. Um, speak to, we'll, we'll kind of open the yeah. floor to you to talk about uh, some, of, some of your projects, some of the stuff you're doing to help, um, I guess, start new developers in the space that maybe have a track record and just sort of bridge the gap from where they are today to getting them some real exposure to some opportunities. So I'd love to just open it up to you and let you go. Uh, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so probably two things to touch on with our with our time remaining. One is, as you mentioned, um, our developer and residence program. Uh, you know, I came from the venture world where you know venture capitalists have entrepreneurs and residents, and um, uh, you know, in the real estate world, uh, I, I hadn't seen anybody do something similar to that. Um, there's a, a local entrepreneur named Alex Robles. And his partner Juan uh, Science, who uh, you know, uh, Latino uh, owned um, an affordable housing group, trying to do kind of workforce in the city and no uh, naturally occurring affordable housing. Um, Alex, as I mean, both of them are, are incredible. But Alex is actually from the neighborhood. He went to Wharton, ten years of real estate experience, and he spent two and a half years, and he couldn't get you know, other than very small projects, he just couldn't get in, uh, you know, he just, it was the chicken or egg in the affordable housing space. So we had a need at the time. I approached Alex and said, Alex, how about you, how about you come on board us for three years? I said, you can take, you know, you can take on some of our larger projects where you can lead and get some of that track record built up. You can work on some of your own projects in the meantime, maybe we'll find some stuff to do together. I'll introduce you to everyone. And then in three years, I'm kicking you out of here and you're on your own. And uh, we're in year two of that developer residence program. These guys have done actually two deals already on their own. Um, and, uh, you know, they've just been, it's just been an incredible experience. But, you know, it, it speaks to the larger, you know, the larger challenge of, you know, how do you, you know, it, it's, it's no accident that, you know, you got to make, you got to have money to make money, but nowhere is that more true than in real estate. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of great, hungry, young talent out there that that, uh, um, you know, that 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 wants to do good and wants to do uh, real estate. And, you know, this is uh, our one way in which we're trying to help people. Before you continue, yeah. at the risk yeah, of getting bombarded with emails, is this something you're planning to continue to do or is this sort of just a one off or where, what's your plan? So that rolls up into our next gen impact program, which is supporting um, impact developers across the country, which I was talking about earlier. So mm -hmm. um, I don't think we're going to do another developer and residence program until they um uh, until we finish with them, uh, it's possible we might, you know, we, we might be open, but, um, uh, um, at the moment that the developer residence program is, is shut. I do get emails about it quite a bit. Um, but, uh, but certainly something we want to continue to do, uh, down the road. 
Awesome. Well, uh, I know we're about out of time here, but let me just kind of end here. Uh, I'm, I'm really impressed. We talk with people a lot on this podcast and a lot of people are doing things with tech, which is really interesting and innovative, but I don't know if we've talked, I, I can't remember everyone, but I don't know if we've talked with anybody who has taken the stance of my job, my le- my legacy in life is to make a ripple throughout. And that was one word you said a couple of times. And it's like, again, stuck in my head. And, um, I don't know, maybe this podcast will be a part of that ripple. Maybe we'll be able to, you know, lend a couple of people or send them in that direction and get people uh, charting a course to where they can do good and still do well. So Brian, thanks for being here. Thanks for sharing this. I'm glad that you and Michael connected. I'm glad that we got, we got to be introduced to you, to what you're doing. Um, if people want to reach out to you or to shift, what's the best way to connect? Yeah, be- best way to connect is probably on LinkedIn. Um, you know, I, 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 I'm an active user. I, I pay attention to inbound. Um, you know, if you're interested in connecting with me, please give me a note. Why? I, I, I don't press accept on all of them, but I do pay attention. That's probably the best way. Obviously, our website, shiftcapital.us, talks about a lot of the things that we're talking about here. And, and there is some uh, abilities for uh, folks to get in touch with us if they're interested in that you know, in, in a possible, uh, a partnership with us. And, uh, we're certainly have open doors to that at the moment as well. Awesome. Shiftcapital.us. Brian, thanks for being here. And for everybody that got to watch or listen, thanks for listening. We'll see you on the next podcast. Thanks for tuning into this episode of the Adventures in CRE audio series. For show notes and additional resources, head over to www.adventuresincre.com slash audio series.